This is a Triple J podcast. Have you ever been on a flight and found that your feet and your lower legs have gotten really swollen? Maybe you've had to use compression socks. Why does that happen? I'm Lucy Smith. Welcome back to Science with Dr. Carl, where we get into that in this week's episode. Plus, do old people really have a distinct smell? And you might have heard the saying, beer before grass, you're on your ass. Grass before beer, you're in the clear. Is there a science to it? Let's find out. Now, Carl, to kick us off, Mm -hmm. I actually have a question for you. Mm -hmm. So I was reading a story on ABC Science about these echidnas who were caught eating the eggs of Queensland's bum-breathing turtles. And, you know, they quite literally had egg on their face and what that potentially... (laughs) Hey, I stole that from their article. Uh, and, And what that potentially means for the future of these turtles. And it's a really interesting article if you want to go check it out on ABC Science. What I wanted to ask you about, Brooke, what obviously caught my attention was the bum-breathing turtle. Are they really breathing through their bums? What's what's that about? It's extra breathing. So um, the first thing to realise is it's called cloacal breathing. Cloaca is the Latin word for sewer. So birds and turtles use that hole at the end of their body for feces and sex and urine and everything. Second thing, uh, they share something that we share, which is that in in the case of a human, you've got a 10 metre gut from your mouth down to the bum. 10 metres. 10 metres. And and the very, and all of it, when, when it's absorbing food, if that food were to go straight into your bloodstream, your brain would go off its face and you would go into some sort of shock. So what happens is that the food that is derived from your gut, it goes firstly into a separate circulation and then to the liver. Then the liver pulls out what it wants, except for a bit at the top under your tongue and a bit at the other end for your bum. Mm. And so uh, parents of newborn babies learn about this when they get Panadol suppositories. So with a baby, it's got a fever. You don't want it to have too much of a fever. So you give it some uh, Panadol in its mouth and it goes, vomit, you know, because it's vomiting. And then you think, how else can I do it? Well, then you shove it up the other end because that goes directly into the general circulation. And the same for the turtle. The blood supply from the cloaca doesn't go into the liver first. It goes straight into the general circulation. So what the turtle does is it goes suck, suck, push, suck, suck, push, and and it brings water in and out of its cloaca maybe every couple of seconds. And they then tend to stay in what are called riffle, R-I-F-F-E-L, zones, which is where the water runs over shallow rocks. And so it's turbulent and it shakes around and you get lots of oxygen in the water. You know how in a fish tank, if it's a big fish tank, you don't have to have a pump. But if it's a little one, you've got to have a pump to keep on bringing oxygen. Mm. In this case, the oxygen molecules fit in between the water molecules, the water molecules look like little boomerangs. The oxygen molecules look like little um, hand weights. And so the, the turtles are in this area where the water's fairly shallow and it's turbulent, so it's got a lot of, lots of oxygen. And while they mainly breathe through their mouth, if they want to, they can stay underwater for days. What? For days. And they're just sort of keeping an eye on things, waiting for some food to come past. So their bot-bot also looks like it's breathing. It's, it's sort it's of sucking in and out. Yeah, but it, from the outside... You probably would, wouldn't notice it because it's fairly turbulent water. Mm-hmm. But but if it was fairly still, you'd be able to see a jet of water coming in and out, in and out, in and out, bringing in oxygen molecules in between the water molecules. It doesn't split the water to give you oxygen. The oxygen molecules are already there. So it's not like they have a respiratory system in their bum. It's just that they're using the oxygen with their cloaca. That's right. So the water comes, it's kind of like a gill on a fish. So there's high oxygen in the water, low oxygen in their blood, and the water and the blood are really close to each other in the cloaca. And the the oxygen molecules go down the concentration gradient from being at a high level in the turbulent water to a low level in their blood. So they use this as a sort of like a top up to stay underwater for days at a time. Well, thanks, Carl. Shucks. See, I had a question. I put it to him. 0439757555. You can do the same. Let's start off with Holly in Kayama. Holly, something's been going on with you for the last six months. What is it? Oh, hi, doctors. Yes, I have a question for you. I used to get the normal everyday grumbling tummy when I had um, hunger pains, that sort of thing. Recently, though, as you say, in the last six months, um, instead of getting that, I get this violent, loud burp that gurgles up from nowhere and completely unexpected. So what's happening? 
Wow. Firstly, don't know, uh, but I'm guessing that it's a combination of you might have matured in your burping system. So somebody in my family has a condition of called a burpia. A meaning not, ear meaning condition of burp. They can't burp. They oh, cannot wow. burp. And so if they have fizzy water, it just builds up as pain and they can't uh, burp up. Now, have you, Holly, been able to burp in the past? Yeah, I used to be a champion burper with my big brother and his friends, so yes. <laughs> How far could you get through the alphabet on one burp? On one burp, I think around the dinner table, it was probably about up to M. <laughs> wow. I used to sing a lot, so I had a good diaphragm control and everything, whether that had anything to do with that. Nice. Okay. So uh, from that, we can work out that you haven't suddenly matured your burp reflex at this incredibly advanced age of more than six years old. <laughs> so in that case, oh, look, I'm having a guess here. I'm guessing there is something to do with the microbiome in your gut changing. Right. We're, we're, so you have, on average, 37 trillion cells in your body that came to you when your parents loved each other very much in a special way your age and nine months ago. But then shortly after birth, you got invaded by, it turns out to be now a total of 40 trillion and most of them live in your gut, and there may be a hundred grams of them, and they change with time. And that's the only thing I can think of mm. that maybe there's been a change in your diet, or maybe you've had a gut condition. I don't know because I can't get, don't have time to go into the history. Now, is it bothering you? Is it something that you feel that is not good for your health? Is it something where you think you need to go and see your GP? Well, the only reason is because I tell my children not to be obnoxious and burp like I used to. I don't tell them I used to do that. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, I'm lucky I work from home and I'm not doing it in the office. But, yeah, it's nothing major. I just thought if I could get to the bottom of it and not burp out loudly unexpectedly, it would be all right. <laughs> and you haven't had any gut illnesses or other illnesses in the last six months or you've taken antibiotics that might have changed no. your gut microbiome? No, that's why I was asking because I assumed if I had have done that, that makes sense. But no, mm. nothing's changed. So I'll just keep an eye on it and see what happens. Ah, we, we have a special medical word for that when you just said keep an eye on it. Uh, the medical phrase is benign and masterful neglect. Really? Yeah, you say, so you'll treat this patient with benign and masterful neglect. You'll just look at them every now and then and do nothing and just see if they get better or worse. If they get better, um, yeah, that's good. And if they get worse, you do something about it. We've got Andrew who's texted in saying, love that word cloaca. I'm going to use that one for sure. When I, when I, <laughs> got, <laughs> when I got school captain in high school, my uncle. You were school captain? Yeah, can you tell? I dreamed of being school captain. <laughs> When my... I didn't even get to be a prefect. <laughs> oh, my God, you were the school camp. Oh, my God, I'm yeah. jealous. I when tell I, but... you, they treat us right differently in the gong back then. That's okay. it. When when I got school captain, my uncle used to call me Captain Cloaca. As a what? joke. Yeah, because <laughs> yeah, we had chickens and he found out that chickens had a cloaca and then he would call me Captain Cloaca. So, I uh... hope it was... It didn't make you feel bad. No, okay. not at all. Not at all. We've got Damo here from Damo? Kaya Bram. Damo, you got a question about sunburn. Yeah, good day, doctors. Um, I've been sunburned in life once or twice, as we all have, and I'm um, just wondering why our hands never seem to get burnt. Mm. Uh, well, firstly, the skin is thicker anyway on the backs of your hands. Secondly, you do get relatively constant exposure, so you tend to build up a bit of a tan. So if you put your um, t- hand on your tummy... Um, Okay, you might expose your tummy to the sun. Okay, on the underpant area, you'll see that it's a darker colour. Then you also have natural oils that can be involved. And then you tend to kind of protect your hands, but you can get burnt on your hands, Mm. but it's relatively uncommon. And I can't think of when I last got burnt on my hands ever. Me no, neither. No. But then you see people who do have uh, tans from where, where their rings are and that kind of thing or yeah, their watch as well. So it does course. happen. Yeah. So, look, I'd rate my answer maybe six out of ten on that one demo. I'm, I, it's not as good as the very first one we had with the bum-breathing turtle. <laughs> and I think I did pretty badly on the uh, a burpia or the burping changes too. Look, no one's keeping score. But I am. Demo, a bit of... <laughs> Okay. Well, say a sort of un- I don't know at this stage. Uh, yeah, definitely don't know. Uh, <laughs> uh, maybe slightly more of thicker skin and natural oils and a bit of protective behaviour in the tanning. Uh, maybe, okay, maybe six and a half, maybe a credit. We've got Simon from Stockton. Now, Simon, your son Kai has a question and you kind of want to pass on the answer. What's going on? Yeah, hi, guys. Um, so Kai has three and he's really interested in things that float and things that sink. 
Um, we were driving over the bridge the other day in one of the old Sydney ferries in the, the harbour in Newcastle, um, and he asked, why do boats float? Um, I sort of have some ideas, I guess, but I have no idea how to explain it to a three-year-old. I just hope Dr. Carl could help me out. You want the official mm. Dr. Carl cosign, Simon. So, Dr. Carl, why do boats float? What's going okay, on? Okay, so firstly think of a big, heavy tree trunk, and it's on land, and you just cannot move it in any direction. But if it's in the water, the water gives it a certain amount of lift. And then that tree trunk... As you put it in the water, it'll sink to a certain degree and then some of the tree trunk will still stay exposed, unless, of course, it's iron bark, in which case it'll sink to the bottom. Okay, so you've got that sort of concept that there's a kind of a flotation-y thing provided by the water. Now think of two separate syndromes. Now you've got a wok. A wok is that Chinese thing for cooking, maybe 30 centimetres, 40 centimetres across, and then you put it in water and it just floats so high. Imagine if you were to get the wok and then just squash it down with a vice, hammer it into a little tiny cube and you put it in the water and it would sink. Mm. And you're trying to think, out, well, it's still the same weight, but what's the difference? And the difference is the Archimedes principle. So Archimedes was this incredibly forward-thinking guy who made it into the latest Indiana Jones movie, apparently. Oh. Yeah, it was the clock of the future. And the um, Anyway, so he, the story goes like this. He put his, he had a bath full of water. He had a bath absolutely full to the top of water and he tried to get into it. And as he put his foot in, the water flowed over the edge And then he kept on putting more of his leg in and more and more water kept on flowing out. And he suddenly realised something, that the weight of the water, if if the object floated, if an object would float in the water, the weight of the water that flowed out was equal to the weight of the object. Now, I'll just say that again slowly. If you've got a floating object, like the wok or a human, and you've got a full container, the weight of the water that flows out equals the weight of the floating object. Mm. If it sinks, it's a, that's a whole different ballpark. So that's what's going on. You spread the mass of the boat or the wok over a large surface area so it doesn't all sink in one go. And so it gets to push out a lot of water. And if the wok weighs, say, uh, a kilogram and it pushes out a kilogram of water and it's still above the water level, well, it stays there. It's because it's so that, but that's a basic principle that if a floating object will push out a weight of water equal to its own weight. Um, and, and this uh, Archimedes was so impressed that apparently he ran through the streets naked because apparently the Greeks would do that in those days, uh, at, least, at least at their Olympic Games, shouting Eureka, meaning literally I have found it. And that's, that's why scientists talk about a eureka moment. Mm. When you look at something and you suddenly realise what's really going on. Does that kind of help, Simon? Yeah, I think that helps. So um, I might have to find myself a wok and a vice and put together an experiment, I think. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, or just a lump of metal. Yeah, if you can find a lump of metal and, and a saucepan would do. Yeah. Yeah, if you have the two of them and you show that they're the same weight and then try to set up a way to catch the water overflowing from a full container and then you can prove to your son that the weight of the water is equal to the weight of the object. What about all like a, a plastic toy with a plastic container? Yeah, there, there's something you can do there. But the, the, you can buy measuring things really cheaply for, you know, like 15 bucks. Like I've, I've got – do you have weighing scales for cooking at home? No, I don't. I'm uh, not that – I'm not that – Particular. Okay, so chuck it in. oh, so you got the artistic and, and often very creative side. Yeah, yeah. Okay, right. Okay, <laughs> creative so creative licenses. Yeah, cooking. so so I think in a weighing scale and then two lumps of metal roughly the same weight, one spread out, one in a lump. Olga from Adelaide, what's your question? Good morning, doctors. Uh, so my question is, why is that old people tend to smell a little bit different, especially men? Ah. Um, uh, amazingly, I was reading a paper on that just earlier this week and it was about the difference in smell between infants and teenagers in their earlier years and teenagers in their later years. And there is a definite smell, but this was the first time I'd ever found out 
a pa- I never found a paper which actually looked at the smells and then analysed them. And, of course, there's a whole bunch of different smells, of course, as you know from your nose. But here they gave them names. This was a fatty acid. This was an aromatic hydrocarbon. There are a whole bunch of different chemicals. And so what we know for sure, now that we're – it's not just our nose, but people have gone and used machines. We know for sure that there are different smells. Why is a whole different ballpark? So you've got to consider – old people and evolution, and for most of evolution, for humans, there were were no old people. Mm. So we've had humans from around 200,000 years ago. How many? A hundred billion have been born in the last 200,000 years, and um, today there's only eight billion alive. Of those hundred billion, the overwhelming majority died before they made 20. Wow. Most of them died before they hit puberty. In my family, my son got TB at an early age and didn't die. My one-year-old daughter had orbital cellulitis and didn't die. And over Christmas, New Year, my granddaughter ended up in hospital and didn't die. So death was everywhere. And there were no such thing as old people were really rare. So from the evolutionary point of view, all it is needed is you get old enough to have babies, 12, 13, and then you wow. can die. I, I, this is really harsh. I know, I know. So, so if you're saying, are there different smells? Definitely yes. Why? Mate, the machine's not running very well. They're trying to keep themselves alive. Mm, yeah, okay, it's like an old car. It might throw out a bit of smoke and stuff, but it's still running. So the why we can't answer at the moment, and it could be that we're just outside of our evolutionary uh, pattern. Mm. Uh, that's not a very satisfying answer, Dr. Olga, for you. But, uh, no, but it gets there. It, it gets there. And, and we, we've definitely measured the difference and it changes in the early teenage years. And so when parents say, he smells, his room smells disgusting, mm. yep. <laughs> sure. That's true. Mm. All right. Thanks, Olga. Sorry, Olga. Thank you. No, Thank that's you. all right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, don't apologise. Okay. We've got, <laughs> got Lachlan from Queensland. Lachlan, Lachlan, what do you want to know this morning? Uh, good morning, doctors. Um, yeah, my question is a bit of an embarrassing one. Hey, um, no embarrassing but, questions. Yeah, but every time I sneeze, like, I don't know what it is, 20 or 30 seconds later, I seem to get... Uh, how can I say this? An, an erection. Okay. Uh, and I was I was wondering if there was any p- specific answer for this. There's a bunch of answers which kind of give leads me to think that then none of them are really good. So firstly, with regard to an erection and ejaculation, the way that medical students are taught about it is point and shoot. Mm-hmm. Point being for the erection and P standing for your parasympathetic nervous system. So your relaxing system gets you the erection. And then the ejaculation, that's a, that's a shoot, that's a sympathetic nervous system. Now, here's a weird thing. When you sneeze, often your sympathetic nervous system is sort of kicked into action, and yet that would be against having an, ere- an erection. Mm. But nevertheless, it happens. We do know that sneezing is an incredibly important reflex because once stuff gets into your lungs, it doesn't get out. So... In the overwhelming majority of people, the sneeze reflex is stronger than it needs to be and is cross-wired. So in about 2% of people, you've got a cross-wiring so much that when they go out into the sunlight, they start sneezing. So in this case, the light falling on their face and their eyes makes them sneeze. But it can be cross-wired the other way that sneezing can set off undesired other reactions. Not necessarily undesired. I mean, there's nothing wrong with it. I mean, it's not just oh, terrorists that have desired. erections. Yeah, regular people have them too. That's how we get babies. Um, uh, so uh, you do get this extra effect. There's, there's other things called the vasovagal effect where you've got this thing called the vagus nerve which literally means wanderer, and it runs from your brain all the way down to your gut, including into uh, the gentle area, and that is thought to be a, a cross-wiring there as well. They say muscle contraction. <laughs> no, nah, don't buy that one. So, yes, it is definitely real. Um, it has a, it's so really been given a, fa- a proper name in the medical literature. It's called a sneeze-induced erection, and then a little bit more vaguely, the snexual response, like not just sexual, but snexual. Snexual. Snexual, like they've shoved an N in there. That's the word they made up. So don't be embarrassed, don't be Glenn. Embarrassed. It's a snexual response. Yeah. A snexual response. I like yeah. your little play on words. Yeah. Oh, oh, shucks. <laughs> okay, so look, I hope it doesn't get too embarrassing for you in public and stuff. Yeah. 
Lachlan, thanks no, for your we question. Won't, we won't get into it. Okay, thank you. Then. Thank you. We've got thanks Jack in Dr. Newcastle here. Jack, Jack, got a question about your body clock. Yes, G'day. Dr. Jack. Oh, g'day, doctors. How are you going? Good. Um, You're welcome. Very my good, question welcome. is, how does your subconscious know what time it is? Like, I get up at quarter to six every morning for work, and on the weekends, it doesn't matter if I go to bed at 10 p.m. or 3 a.m., I will still get up at quarter to six. Mm. What line of work are you in, Dr. Jack? I'm a carpenter. You're a chippy. Without plum, without the trays, there is no civilization. And I was just reading an article how in Paris, part of the reason that Paris is such a livable city is that the people who work there can live there. And so there's government-supported housing so the people who are not fabulously wealthy can live in government housing in the city and make it the city that it is. Whereas in, for example, London is a classic case where the people who work there have to travel for two hours to work mm. there. Getting back to now that we've said what a good bloke you are for being a carpenter mm. and keeping society um, running, um, what's happening is that before you awake a few hours earlier, you start pumping out a chemical called cortisol um, and this chemical gradually increases in how much you've got in your blood. You know, you might go from one milligram per litre into two, into three, and it gradually increases during the morning. But the thing that wakes you up is how fast it increases. There's a subset of people who, if you get them into a laboratory and say, I want you to wake up at quarter six tomorrow or half past seven, and you monitor their cortisol level, the amount they produce reaches its maximum level. So they're, they're, they're pumping it out fastest at a certain time, and they can time that, and we don't know how, so that they wake at the same time. So that's happened to you. So that, 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 we, that much of the pathway we know in that we know that it's the rate at which that chemical is pumped out. But why some people can do it and some can't, we don't know. Mm. And I'm guessing it might be very frustrating if you've got a really late night and you've been out partying and you still wake up early. Does that yeah. happen? Yeah. Yep, yep, can you get back to sleep though? Uh, sometimes. Oh. oh, does it happen on the weekends as well as on work days? Yeah, you said that. It does. Yeah. Oh, there are some people who can switch off on the weekend. Okay, now here's your chance to become a guru and then train yourself. I don't know how. But train yourself to switch it off on the weekends. Mm. So I'm guessing you don't work Sundays? Um, no, no. Not right. usually sad days either. Well, you, look, you make that your goal and at least that way you can party. Amber in Melbourne. Amber? What's your question? Dr. Amber, welcome. Uh, good morning, uh, doctors. It's, I'm having a good day. Thank you. My question today is I've always heard down the grapevine, I mean, maybe, maybe it goes back further, that beer before grass and you're on your ass, grass before beer and you're in the clear. And I was just wondering what truth there was to that. Mm. Well, um, a peer-reviewed paper by Snoop Dogg says that. <laughs> really? <laughs> uh, yeah, Snoop Dogg's pretty uh, up on that. And it's been around enough in the common parlance, the language, the vibe, that you make it makes you think there's something going on. Now, the first thing to realise is that all, all drugs are poisons. What matters is the dose. You've got to have them responsibility. You don't want to make any decisions while you're high on alcohol or anything else. Are there any more PSAs I should get out of the way before I can get onto the real stuff? No, that's a, that's I, think, good I think we're good. Okay, we, we, we covered all the obligatory stuff. Okay, now the first thing to realise about alcohol, and this is really surprising, is it is not an excitatory drug. So when you have some, you're thinking, oh, I'm going to get up and I'm going to dance and, I'm, and you're feeling all excited. Rather, it's a depressant drug that depresses the depressing part of your brain. So mm-hmm. part of your brain says, slow down, part says, get up, and it depresses the depressant part so the excitatory part takes away, takes over. So the overall effect is that it's an excitatory drug. As such, it can enhance the effects of the cannabis coming after it. And sometimes those effects can be good and sometimes it can be bad, but in general they're sort of saying it is bad. Can you explain the excitatory part again? Okay. So so everything in your body is modulated and there's forces pushing this way and that. And so in your brain there's something to keep you awake and something to keep you calm down. Alcohol... Uh, excites or uh, alcohol depresses the depressant part. Mm-hmm. 
and without the depressant part working, then your excitatory part has a stronger play in how you act. Ah, yes, so, yes, yes. So you've got these two four. So everything in your body is a balance of a, a bunch of things. And so this depressant drug depresses your depression centre, so then you get more up. I'm not talking about depression as in the condition, mm. but rather just a general excitation. So but the, the overall, so I thought I'd get that out of the way, rather confusingly, the overall result is that it is an excitatory drug. Its effect is excitatory on your brain and it can then excite the effects of cannabis further. Oh. Right? And the, the, so in your particular case, your, your preferred drug might be cannabis or alcohol or water or God knows what. But um, you might find that having the alcohol first brings in effects of cannabis that don't exist when you have the cannabis by itself. Oh. That, that is the thinking as to why we've got the – now, what's the phrase again? Beer before grass, grass. you're on your ass. Yeah, okay. Grass before beer, you're in the clear. I don't have an answer about the second part. Okay. But the first part – so I've asked a few neuropharmacologists and that was the best that they could come up with. Mm. Okay, is Amber. Any reason, yeah, yeah, sorry. Is there on. any reason as to why it happens so fast as well? So tell me what, what happens in your case or uh, what, what well, you've heard people say. In, in in a, in a theoretical case, a theoretical say, case, yeah. Um, that I've had gone out in the night and had a couple of couple of drinks and come home um, and had a have a little bit of a, a oil oil pourer yep. for vase, um, and then instantly on the toilet spewing my guts up. Oh, okay. So it's not a mental state; it's now a physical. You're vomiting. Yeah. Oh, don't know, don't know. No, that's okay. But that's interesting. It'd be interesting to see. I thought it was a mental thing because I heard when I heard people come up with a saying. Mm. So much to learn, Lucy. But you're on your ass. You know, you could be vomiting. <laughs> could be, yeah. And make sure you're in a part of Australia where it is legal to have both. Et cetera, okay. et cetera. Yeah. Not condoning anything wrong. Mm-hmm. Right, okay. Hmm. Well, thank like you. Very, very good, Amber. That's so interesting about the way that alcohol before anything could then increase those effects because the – depressant part isn't working as hard now. Yeah, th- 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 that's nicely said. I should have, I will steal that in future. Thank you, Dr. Lucy. Yeah, absolutely. We've got Jacob from Jacob. the Mornington Peninsula. Now, Jacob, you were playing a game recently and there was a saying on the screen. What, what's going on? Hi, doctors. So I was playing a game recently and I was fighting a werewolf or something and the main character mentioned that, like, it had gone back to its lair to lick its wounds Is there any, like, is that, first of all, is that a real thing? And is there any, like, benefit to licking your wounds? So many animals do it. I think there has to be. Um, Firstly, you're getting rid of the dirt and the other stuff that could carry germs and bad things could happen and, of course, tetanus. Clostridium tetani is one of the bad things that can happen. Secondly, now I haven't found a paper on this, so I'm just hypothesising here. Almost certainly there are factors, immune system factors, in your saliva that will be of benefit when you lick your wound. Um, At one occasion we were travelling in the outback, I spent a total of two years travelling in the Australian outback, and a little willy-willy storm came through and collapsed things and... My son's thumb got squashed and the very first thing I did was stick it in my mouth mm. as, a, as a reflex. Yeah. It was that powerful. Um, and I was trying to sort of suck it open to, you know, to, so to, to counteract the squashing that had happened from the thing that got squashed between a mechanism as a Give collapse. Give it some heat. Heat? I don't know. So the answer is I don't know what's going on and this is more homework for me but almost certainly there's something going on there. Okay. Uh, lick your wound. I'm writing it down <laughs> for homework. Look, thank you for that. This, this might be next week's answer. I feel like sometimes I think it's a, you know, I'll do the same thing if I get a paper card or something like that. It's almost, uh, uh, is it a natural cleaning agent? I don't know. Ah, and now what was the other thing about the saliva? Yes, 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 yes. So every now and then when you're using a new toothbrush, It'll be a bit harder than it should be and you'll get a little bit of bleeding and how come sometimes, now your, your mouth is just full of bacteria, it's just loaded with bacteria, how come the bacteria don't jump onto that blood and get into your bloodstream and give you a bad time? So most of the blood is flowing out of the wound but, you know, if you, some of it can get in. How come getting a cut in your mouth and using a new 
toothbrush doesn't give you a terrible infection. Mm. And finally, somebody asked the question and they found that your tongue makes antibiotics. <gasps> and the word coming into my mind is maganin, M-A-G-A-N-I-N. I've never said it out loud, but I've read it a few times. And this is going back about a decade. So that, that's another answer to your question, Dr. J, that um, your tongue, tongue makes antibiotics. Mm. And maybe that helps. Okay. Thanks, Thanks Jacob. For that, Thank you, Dr. Jacob. We've got Kaylee in Canberra, also kind of getting into the science fiction world. What's your question? Hi, doctors. Um, Recently, I've read a couple of books that gave similar descriptions um, when a person travels in just in space, not in time. One was A Wrinkle in Time by Madeline Liangle, Mm -hmm. uh, and the second was Iron Flame by Rebecca Yaros. But basically, after the character had made a jump in space um they both described like tingling in their fingers as if the uh circulation was returning after like a period of being numb or not circulating um but obviously for them it's happening instantaneously so what would cause that sort of physical reaction Mm. you're, you're, you're saying that you're reading science fiction yes you're my bestie yeah how many how many do you read a week uh, well, they've been quite thick novels recently, um, so they take a little bit to get through, uh, but the A Wrinkle in Time ones are quite small, so um, you get through them in a day or two, depending on how much I'm working. Right. So um, have you read The Three Body Problem yet? No. Oh, mate, there's a TV series coming out on that. Uh, it's a bit scary, but go for it. Three Body Problem. Okay. So okay. they're doing a jump through hyperspace. Now we know that there are four dimensions of space and time. Uh, in space, there's three backwards, forwards, left, right, up, down. In time, the thing clicks forward. And you're jumping through other dimensions. And what I'm guessing, to try and fit in with the overall storyline of the book, is that you're getting a compression of space and your fingers might go flying because they're furthest out from your body and they might experience a bit of squashy space. That's about all I can come up with, which is a pretty weak answer. But I do love science fiction. I love the fact that you're reading it. So you're in a little bubble. And if you fingers happen to, at the end of your arms, go out towards the edge, of the bubble, they're going into this higher gravity space continuum thingy. I'm making it up as I'm going along. Does it, <laughs> does it fit with you, Kaylee? Does that is that kind of a half answer? Yeah, that kind of um, makes sense. It's just both books described the physical reaction to be sort of the same and it kind of piqued my interest. Oh, so you're saying also secretly that they're actually real and that we have got secret military machines that can take us through space-time and this is your way of letting Australia know that they really have got this technology but not keeping it secret from us. Yeah, potentially. Okay, just thought we'd put it out there. Lara in Brisbane got a question about flying. Yeah, so I am... Going to Thailand soon, mm. and I was just wondering, like, why do body parts swell when you fly and are in the air? Because last time I went to Europe, it happened to me. And previously, growing up, whenever I've gone, it's never happened. So I just thought, is there a way to prevent it? Mm. Ah, so how old were you when you went previously and did not have it happen? Yes, I've flown to Europe when I was 8, 10, 12, 16, and 19. Ah, and like it never happened, but yeah. And how old are you? And how old were you the first time it happened? Were you like in your early twenties? Uh, I was nineteen, yeah, and I'm twenty two now. And it happened when you were nineteen. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's kind of the whole evolution over the hill. Body doesn't need you anymore. So, <laughs> well, the reflexes are not as good as they were. So, um, in an aeroplane, the atmosphere is at a lower pressure than it is on the ground. Um, It's maybe 70 or 80% of what it is on the ground. The reason that they do not have it at 100% is that they'd have to make the cylinder of the aeroplane very strong and that would make the aeroplane heavy and that would cut into the payload of paying passengers that it would carry. So it's normally set at around 8,000 feet, where it's probably 70% of what it is down at ground level. Uh, they, they, they couldn't just let it be uh, what it, you know, the outside pressure when you're flying at 30,000 feet because everybody in the aeroplane would go unconscious. So you've got the system that you've got in your body evolved 
to survive at your normal environment. If, for example, you lived at high altitude, um, at say over 8,000 feet, and then you took a plane trip, you wouldn't get that swelling, I'm guessing. Because right. you normally live at 8,000 feet and your body has changed over the last six months or a year. So you're loose, used to living at 8,000 feet altitude where the air pressure is less and the air pressure in an aeroplane is equivalent to 8,000 feet. Mm. So it's just like the same you normally live at. But you're probably living closer to ground level. So you've got that short-term yeah. change. And it's kind of like a balloon and you spread out. Well, you don't spread out like to increase your volume by 30% because you've got skin and skin is made of leather, but you will swell to some degree. It happens more in the legs because you've got the blood going down and then you don't actually have an active pump. Your your pump is up in your heart. And so the way you get the blood flowing back is by war, by the fact that there's a bit of pressure pushing it uphill, but also you've got what they call the muscle pump of your legs, of your calves and your thighs bringing it up. Right. So compression I guess the, socks, I guess. Because, I, I, I've worn compression uh, stockings uh, when I was more paranoid about it, and, and they definitely work. They definitely do really work. Uh, get them from a chemist. Douglas in Frankston. Last one. What's your question? Hey, doctors. Uh, my question is: uh, What would happen if gravity suddenly doubled? Um, that would be very unfortunate, and most of us would have difficulty in breathing. I've done uh, a flight with the Royal Australian Air Force uh, aerobatics team, the Roulettes, and I wore a G suit. And when we were pulling five Gs, it was really uncomfortable. So you would find it very difficult to move around, and you'd find it difficult to breathe if the gravity doubled. Mm. But on a long term, uh, all of life would evolve to be lower and closer to the ground because the structural integrity of the materials is the same, but the gravity is higher. Oh. But in the short term, you could you get away with two Gs, I reckon, but it's, unco- it's definitely uncomfortable. In the G-suit, you can feel the bladder pumps squeezing against your calf and pushing the blood up into your thighs and then the pumps in the thighs push the blood up into your chest and the ones in your chest push it up into your head and so you don't go unconscious. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Science with Dr. Carl. We love having you as part of the fam. If you get to like, subscribe, rate, leave a review, please do so so we know you're out there. Maybe you've got a question that you want to leave in your review for Dr. Carl. Let us know via Apple Podcasts. I'm Lucy Smith. This episode was produced by Sarah Harvey, and we will catch you next week. Bye. Have a good one. Dave Marchese here from the Triple J Hack team. Hey, if you love Dr. Carl's podcast like I do, you might enjoy the Hack podcast as well. Each day we bring you the news that matters to you, from the latest science on climate change to what's happening in politics and news around the world. The Hack podcast. It's your daily fix of the news you need to know. Get it wherever you're listening now.